Please, congregation, turn your Bibles with me this morning to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll read verses 3 through 14 in connection with articles 8 and 9 of our confession of faith. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. This is God's holy word. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. To the praise of His glorious grace, which with, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Let's turn also in our Belgian Confession to Articles 8 and 9, page 158 in our Forms and Prayers books. Article 8 of our Confession of Faith. In keeping with this truth and word of God, we believe in one God, who is one single essence in whom there are three persons, really, truly, and eternally distinct according to their incommunicable properties, namely Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is the cause, origin, and source of all things, visible as well as invisible, The Son is the Word, the wisdom and image of the Father. The Holy Spirit is the eternal power and might, proceeding from the Father and the Son. Nevertheless, this distinction does not divide God into three, since Scripture teaches us that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit each has His own subsistence distinguished by characteristics, yet in such a way that these three persons are only one God. It is evident, then, that the Father is not the Son, that the Son is not the Father, and that likewise the Holy Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son. Nevertheless, these persons, thus distinct, are neither divided nor fused or mixed together. For the Father did not take on flesh, nor did the Spirit, but only the Son. The Father was never without the Son, nor without His Holy Spirit, since all these are equal from eternity and one in the same essence." There is neither a first nor a last, for all three are one in truth and power, in goodness and mercy. All these things we know from the testimonies of Holy Scripture, as well as from the effects of the persons, especially from those we feel within ourselves. The testimonies of the Holy Scriptures, which teach us to believe in this Holy Trinity, are written in many places of the Old Testament, which need not be enumerated, but only chosen with discretion." In the book of Genesis, God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. Indeed, male and female, he created them. Behold, man has become like one of us. It appears from this that there is a plurality of persons within the deity when he says, let us make man in our image. And afterwards, he indicates the unity when he says, God created It is true that he he does not say here how many persons there are, but what is somewhat obscure to us in the Old Testament 
is very clear in the new. When our Lord was baptized in the Jordan, the voice of the Father was heard saying, This is my dear Son. The Son was seen in the water, and the Holy Spirit appeared in the form of a dove. So in the baptism of all believers, this form was prescribed by Christ. Baptize all people in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the gospel according to Luke, the angel Gabriel says to Mary, the mother of our Lord, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore that Holy One to be born of you shall be called the Son of God. And in another place it says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. There are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. In all these passages, we are fully taught that there are three distinct persons in one and only divine essence. And although this doctrine surpasses human understanding, we nevertheless believe it now through the Word, waiting to know and enjoy it fully in heaven. Furthermore, we must note the particular works and activities of these three persons in relation to us. The Father is called our Creator by reason of His power. The Son is our Savior and Redeemer by His blood. The Holy Spirit is our Sanctifier by living in our hearts. This doctrine of the Holy Trinity has always been maintained in the true church, from the time of the apostles until the present, against Jews, Muslims, and certain false Christians and heretics, such as Marcion, Manny, Praxius, Sibelius, Paul of Samosota, Arius and others like them, who were rightly condemned by the Holy Fathers. And so in this matter, we willingly accept the three ecumenical creeds, the apostles, Nicene and Athanasian, as well as what the ancient fathers decided in agreement with them. This congregation, the Church of Christ, does believe and confess throughout the world. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we come now to Articles 8 and 9 of our Confession of Faith and to the doctrine of the Trinity, I recognize that there are perhaps some of us here this morning who are perhaps wondering to ourselves, how is, how is the doctrine of the Trinity really relevant in my life today? It's easy for us to read these rather lengthy articles and to hear the language of God's unity of essence and His plurality of persons and to say, this is best left for the theologians. What we have to recognize this morning, congregation, is that it is only when we contemplate the Trinity that we come to know who and what our God really is. It's only when we contemplate the Trinity, God's threeness and His oneness, that we come to know who and, and what God is for us, for fallen humanity. And so as we consider these two articles of our confession, it's particularly necessary that we do so, as Boving says, with, with a tone of holy reverence and childlike awe and wonder. I was reminded of that familiar account from the life of Moses in Exodus chapter 3, when, when after the God of Israel had, had heard his people's groanings and cries, he, he appeared to Moses as in a burning bush. You'll likely recall that when Moses saw the bush burning but not consumed, his immediate reaction was, was to draw near and to examine more closely how this could be so. But as Moses drew near to that burning bush, what did God say from the fire? Moses, Moses, do not come any closer, for the ground upon which you are standing is holy ground. He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob. And then we read in Exodus 3 that Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Well, congregation, such is the holy respect that suits us as well this morning as God himself speaks to us in his word and reveals himself to us in his word even as he revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush so long ago. We must always remember, right, Sermon Bovink, that as we study the triune God, we aren't just dealing with a doctrine about God. We aren't just dealing with some abstract concept or or idea that man made to understand God, but rather in, in treating the Trinity, we're dealing with God himself. We're dealing with the one true God who has revealed himself as such in his word. Just as he revealed himself to Moses saying, I am 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so too he reveals himself to us in his words, saying, I am the same God. I am Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's why what Article 9 of our Confession endeavors to show us that all these things we know from the testimonies of the Holy Scriptures, as well as from the effects of the persons, especially from those which we feel within ourselves. Which is to say that we only confess what God Himself has revealed. And as we make this confession, as we live this confession, God confirms what He has revealed in our hearts. He he impresses these things upon our hearts that when we pray, we, we experience the knowledge that the Father hears us when we pray in Jesus' name. And when we give in to sin, we experience the, the truth of God's Word, that we feel the Spirit convicting our hearts and, and causing us and summoning us to, to look again to Christ for forgiveness of our sins. And so, boys and girls, and we can fast the apostles and Nicene Creed Sunday after Sunday. We aren't just saying what we think about God, but rather we're giving expression to the reality that that our God is indeed the true and living God, that He is our confidence, that He is our salvation. We're giving expression to the reality that He is the God on, on whom we have depended and rested. He is the God to whom we have surrendered the entirety of our lives. As Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God has created us, redeemed us, and sanctified us. And so He requires everything from us. But there is no greater joy or comfort, says Bobbing, than to believe in this God, to trust Him, and to expect everything from Him. This doctrine of the Trinity, then, is indeed at the very heart and core of the Christian faith. It is the dividing line between us and every false religion and religious sect in the world. And so it is therefore of the highest importance both for heart and mind. If one does not confess what the Christian faith confesses concerning the Holy Trinity, there is no salvation for him. But as the opening lines of the Athanasian Creed remind us, whoever desires to be saved should above all hold to this Catholic or universal faith concerning the Trinity For anyone who does not keep it whole and unbroken will doubtless perish eternally. Now this is the Catholic and universal faith that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity. Congregation, if we don't understand something of the wonder of who God is, then we'll never be able to worship Him as He deserves. Thus writes Bob Inglis, he concludes, the confession of the Trinity is the sum of of the entire Christian religion. Without it, neither the creation, nor the redemption, nor the sanctification can be purely maintained. For every departure from this confession leads to error in all the other heads of doctrine. For we can truly proclaim the mighty works of God only when we recognize and confess them as the one great work of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For in the love of the Father... In the grace of the Son, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is contained, the whole salvation of man. And so contrary to what you might be inclined to think at first glance, there's nothing dull or boring at all about the Trinity. Because Jesus tells that knowing God as He has revealed Himself is eternal life. Life in the new heaven and new earth will will consist of of knowing this great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, more intimately than we have ever known Him before. Therefore, says one pastor, He requires of us in His Word that the personal distinctions between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be personally noted and clearly confessed. For in so doing, we engage in humble and hearty adoration of Him who is our salvation. This congregation is really at the heart of our aim this morning to give our humble and and hearty adoration and praise of our triune God. Our aim this morning is to give praise to to the Father who has chosen us from before time. Our aim is to give praise to the Son who, who redeemed us in time and to give praise to the Holy Spirit who has sealed us for all time. These are the three things we want to do together this morning as we follow the logic and take heed of the calling of the Apostle Paul to bless this 
triune God who has so richly blessed us. These words which Paul has recorded for us here in Ephesians chapter 1 constitute a great doxology, a poem of praise to our God for all the blessings of the gospel. And so we begin where Paul has begun, namely in praise of the Father, which Paul spells out for us especially in verses 3 to 6. In our ESV Bibles, verses 3 to 14 are are broken down into five senses. But as some of you may know, the original language, this passage comes to us in but one sentence comprising 200-some words. And so Sinclair Ferguson rightly refers to it as a sentence begun in eternity. Because that's what we find at the very outset of this passage. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Here we discover a congregation that receiving grace leads to the enjoyment of every spiritual blessing. And that it is as though we are already now seated with Christ in the heavenly places. In virtue of our union with Christ, this has become our reality as Paul will go on to explain in greater detail in the next chapter. This phrase, in the heavenly places, thus refers to a new realm of spiritual reality, says one pastor, into which believers have been brought in Christ. Here we are given a survey of the superabundance of blessings that have come to us in and with Christ, election, adoption, redemption, sanctification, forgiveness. Big words, he says, big blessings. And these spiritual blessings, which are now ours we discover are grounded and founded upon the love that God had for you and me from before the foundation of the world. Notice already at the start of verse 3 that Paul has spoken of God as Father. And this word in and of itself, congregation, is a a wonderful revelation that we often gloss over as we read through the New Testament. But But this God is the same God of Isaiah chapter 6, of whom the angels sing, holy, holy, holy. And Paul now refers to him as Father. This triune God, you see, is not some cruel dictator or tyrant in heaven. But he is and always has been a father. And we know that it is in a father's nature to love his children. And so Paul is saying from the very out so that we can be sure that this great God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is our God and Father. He is not against us. He is not ambivalent towards us. But He is for us. Even when we have fallen into sin yet again, He does not leave us or forsake us as Satan would have us to believe. But He sets us back on our feet in order that we might once again begin to walk with Him. Paul tells us here that the Father's love for us stretches from before the dawn of time and until the end of time, indeed into all eternity. The Father, we confess in Articles 8 and 9 of our confession, is the cause, origin, and source of all things visible and invisible. Therefore, He is called our Creator and by reason of His power. Here in Ephesians chapter 1, we see how God has further put His power to work. For we have not only seen his power in creation, but we also see his power, and I've experienced that power more poignantly and more fully in in the recreation and causing us to be born again. And so we say with Paul, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For God has chosen us in Christ from before the foundation of the world. Boys and girls, God is so gracious, and His grace is so gracious that He had you and me in view even before we came to believe in Him. And His grace is so gracious that He had you and me in view even before we were made from before the foundation of the world. Before time, when there was only the Father, the Son, and the Spirit dwelling together in perfect unity, in perfect communion, 
already God had predestined in love to draw a people unto himself to be his very own. God had us in his heart before we or anyone else had ever been made. Now we hear that and perhaps we wonder, why would God ever choose me? But the answer the Bible gives us is that God chose you because he loved you. And so you might ask, well, why would God ever love me? To which the Bible says God loved you because he loved you. God loved you because he loved you, because he saw fit to glorify himself by being gracious to you. And the Father loved us, says Paul, so that we should be holy and blameless before him. God, we recognize, did not choose us because we were holy, because there is something so worthy or or beautiful in ourselves. But God chose us that we might become holy. This, writes Sinclair Ferguson, is the logic of God's love. Love that has chosen to love us. Love that has sacrificed and waited for us. Love that has been patient with us. This passionate love of God, once received, does not, indeed cannot, leave us unchanged. For he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, says Paul, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Congregation, we need to remember this, and we have given into sin yet again. We have committed that sin. We, we swore to ourselves we would never commit again that God does not accept us on the base of who we are, but on the base of who Christ is. He accepts us and blesses us in the beloved, says Paul. And so as one pastor has said, it is only when the Father stops loving the Son that He will ever stop loving you. It will never happen. For He accepts us and blesses us in the Beloved. For in Him, says Paul, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In the fullness of time, congregation Christ came to accomplish what the Father had given him to do, namely to redeem his people from the penalty and power of sin. And when Christ came into the world, he he revealed to us more fully who God is than he had ever been known before. To be sure, there were were glimpses and clues throughout the Old Testament scriptures, like like we read in Genesis 1, let us make make man in our image. And there are glimpses throughout the Psalms when, when David says things like, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And there were glimpses when David said, where where can I go from your spirit? But when the Son of God, Christ the Redeemer, came into the world as the Word, as the wisdom and image of the Father, He brought into clear view for you and me the fullness of who God is. Already at the announcement of His conception, what did the the angel Gabriel say to Mother Mary? He said, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. And to him to whom you give birth shall be called the Son of God. And then once again at his baptism, all three persons were made manifest. And the Father spoke from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And as Jesus stood there in the waters, taking upon himself that, that office as the Christ, and as a spirit appeared over him in the form of a dove. And for this reason we confess in Article 9, Christ prescribed that we should all be baptized into the name, singular, of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The New Testament makes perfectly clear that God is indeed Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all the while maintaining the Old Testament confession, Hero is, or the Lord our God is one. For such is the revelation that the Son of God brought into clear review. 
And for this reason, the New Testament has no problem speaking of, of the three persons in different orders because we confess that each person is equal from eternity and one in the same essence. There is neither first nor last, for all three are one in truth and power, in goodness and mercy. And so while Jesus said, for example, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Paul had no trouble giving this benediction, the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. And Peter had no problem greeting the saints of the, of, of the dispersion, saying, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for the obedience to Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Because when Christ came into the world, he brought the unity of God's essence and the plurality of his persons into clear view. Saying that eternal life consists of knowing the only true God and knowing him fully. And this is why Paul says that it is indeed in him, in Christ Jesus, that we have redemption through his blood. Because before Christ, we were alienated from God. We could not possibly know God aright, being enslaved to sin. Our hearts were hard and our eyes were blind to see God as He really is. But at the cross, the Son of God redeemed us from that power of sin and secured our place in the heavenly places. And in Him, verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. We have to recognize this morning, congregations, that when we become Christians, it's not merely that we receive a, a benefits package from Christ, forgiveness, new life, new hope, and so on. But when we become Christians, we receive Christ Himself. We receive God Himself. We are brought into communion with this triune God in the heavenly places. And this is the chief work of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son who, who brings us to Christ and Christ to us, who, who affects that union and, and communion with God. It's the Holy Spirit who so unites us to Christ that all that Christ has accomplished for us is indeed credited to us and becomes ours. That's again how the Apostle expresses it in verses 13 and 14. In Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. The Holy Spirit, we confess in Articles 8 and 9, is the eternal power and might proceeding from the Father and the Son. He is our sanctifier by living in our hearts. The Holy Spirit, who was there at the very beginning of creation, hovering over the surface of the waters. And the Holy Spirit, who was there also in our redemption as Christ, offered himself to the Father by the power of the Spirit, as Hebrews 9.14 tells us. This same Spirit now lives and dwells in our hearts. That as the baptism form reminds us, when we are baptized into the Holy Spirit, God promises to make his home within us and to sanctify us as members of Christ. He will impart to us what we have in Christ, namely the washing away of our sins and the daily renewing of our lives. And as a result of his work within us, we shall finally be presented without the stain of sin among the assembly of the elect in life eternal. The congregation, the Spirit of Christ has come to do what the Lord promised he would do by the prophets. He has come to give us a, a new heart and a new spirit so we might walk in his statutes and keep his ordinances and do them, Ezekiel 11, verses 19 and 20. This is something of the promise that the Apostle Paul is pressing upon us here. I trust you've noticed by now the uniquely Trinitarian structure of Paul's doxology. In verses 3 through 6, he speaks of the love of the Father. And then he speaks in verses 7 to 12 about the redemption of the Son, how he has accomplished that will of the Father. 
And yet Paul knows that if the story of our salvation ended there, it would not be enough for unless the Holy Spirit comes to to apply what Christ accomplished, what Christ accomplished is, is nothing to us. But proceeding from the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit comes to effect within us that redemption in our own lives. He comes to apply what Christ accomplished. He comes to us as God's seal of the gospel promise, as the guarantee of the pledge of our inheritance. His presence in our lives, you see, is God's assurance that every spiritual blessing will be ours. The Holy Spirit, says St. Clair Ferguson, is is the down payment. He is the first installment of the final consummation of all the blessings that we will one day receive and experience in the new creation. This is why we celebrate this Pentecost Sunday, the gift of the Spirit. As we remember the manner in which the ascended Christ kept His promise He had made to His disciples. When He said, and I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him. For He dwells with you and will be in you. This helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. And so it happened that ten days after Christ ascended into heaven to sit at God's right hand, we find the powerful account in Acts chapter 2 that when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rest on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. The Spirit gave them utterance. So the message of God's divine plan for salvation was heard by each person in his own language. And then Peter proclaimed that the Lord of heaven had finally brought to pass the prophetic word from Joel, and in the last days it shall be, declares the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so to this very day, the Holy Spirit continues to press this message upon the hearts of those whom God has chosen, those for whom Christ has died. Notice in verses 13 and 14, the connection between the Word and the Spirit. For it is the Spirit who works in the Word and and with that Word of truth to, to convict us of our sins and who draws us near to the Savior. And so if you've ever found yourself in a sermon being convicted of sin or being swept up in the the sweetness of the gospel, that's not the words of the preacher. That's not the preacher, but that's that's the Spirit. The Spirit working with the Word and and in the Word to, to stir up worship and wonder in your hearts. This is what the Spirit of Christ does. He is the guarantee of our inheritance until we shall acquire the possession of it to the praise of His glory. And so we confess, congregation, that although this doctrine of the Trinity surpasses human understanding, we nevertheless believe it now through the Word, waiting to know and enjoy it fully in heaven. But as we wait with patience, we live with praise. That's The point that Paul is pressing upon us here, that that doctrine leads to doxology, all these things, to to the praise of His glory. So I have to say that as long as the Lord tarries, this is what you and I are called to do, to live in praise of the triune God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father has come to us in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Congregation, what on earth can be greater than this? What can be greater than the reality that the triune God in whom there is perfect union, in whom there is perfect communion, has brought us into communion with Himself? 
what can be a greater wonder than the fact that God has, has answered the, the Savior's high priestly prayer when he prayed, I ask that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This congregation is what salvation is really all about. Salvation is about you and me being brought into communion with this triune God. We should have fellowship with him. This communion was once described by the great Puritan John Owen this way, saying, Now communion is the mutual sharing of those things which delight all those in that fellowship. For those who enjoy this communion with God are gloriously united to God through Christ and share in all the glorious and excellent fruits of that communion. And so our communion with God, he says, lies in his giving himself to us and our giving ourselves to him. This communion, says Owen, will one day be perfect and complete. And we shall enter into the full enjoyment of Christ's glory. For then we shall totally give ourselves up to Him, resting in Him as the utmost fulfillment of all our desires. <clears throat> Indeed, congregation, he who testifies to all these things says, Behold, I am coming soon. And so we say in response, even so, come. Take us into that great and perfect communion to the praise of your glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, indeed in sweet communion with you, we would constantly abide as you bring us ever closer and closer to your side. We thank you, O God, that although our heart and our flesh may fail, you are the strength of our hearts, and you yourself are our portion forever. Father, we confess that it is a lofty mystery to understand the, the nature of your character and the nature of your being, being three in one. But we believe it, Father, because you revealed it to us. And we long for the day when we shall understand it more fully and we see the Son face to face. Lord, we thank you for the sweet communion that we experience already now in this life, that we have communion with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that we already now experience that great joy of your giving yourself to us as we give ourselves to you. Lord, we eagerly wait for the day when that communion shall be full, when it shall no longer be hindered by the sins and desires of the flesh, when that communion shall no longer ever be disrupted by the things we have done, but when our union and communion will be pulled together in perfect harmony. Father, until that day we pray that you would cause us to live in the praise of your holy name, that we would live as children of the Father, as servants of the Son, that we would live comforted always by the Spirit as he brings to remembrance all that you have done and all that you have said. This we ask, Lord, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.